Come in. Uh, hi, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to uh, Plattform. Platform is uh, the lecture series here at Bergen Kunsthall. We have, uh, I just realized that uh, it's a 10 year anniversary this uh, year for the Platform series. So uh, in, in 2018, and this is the first uh, Platform event this year. Uh, and we're really thrilled to be um, welcoming Jelena Martinovic and uh, Joachim Kester. Of course, in relation to Joachim's exhibition downstairs, it's opened yesterday bringing something back. Um, I'm not going to talk for uh, very long. Uh, just welcome you all um, uh, and give you a quick introduction to how we have planned this uh, event. Uh, Jelena will be speaking first um, uh, with a lecture that's called Out of the Body into the Mind, Near-Death Experiences, Mountaineering and Psy Sciences in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and after that, we'll open for a very quick round of uh, questions, if there's a couple of questions directly to that talk uh, from the audience. And then uh, Yelena will be joined by uh, Joachim for a conversation. Um, yeah, that's it. I think uh, there's handouts um, so you can read more about uh, the exhibition. And Yelena, maybe I should also mention uh, uh, very quickly, Yelena, um, works currently as a researcher at the University of College in London, Institute of Advanced Studies, Health Humanities Center. Um, and her book, Mort Imminent, with the English title is Near-Death Experience, How Psychiatry Turned a Folk Phenomenon into Therapeutic Insight, uh, was published last year in June. Um, yeah, so welcome. Yeah, hello everybody and uh, thanks um, to Steiner and Joachim for this um, general, generous invitation and I'm happy to continue the conversations, ongoing conversations we had um, with uh, Joachim since this summer. So um, today I'm going to be talking about 40 minutes and, uh, and then we'll have time for questions. But it, I will just present uh, a couple of ideas related to my research that I've been conducting over the past years. And it's basically looking at the strange and kind of complex origins of out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences in mountaineering. And so going back to the 19th century. Um, and so there are, of course, many ways to look as a historian um, into the history of out-of-body experiences. You know, you can go into neurology or uh, paranormal phenomena studies that uh, you know, studied out-of-body experiences um, as a shamanic flight or that explained out-of-body experiences as visual illusions in neurology. And of course, you can study near-death experience in, um, you know, at the intersection of medicine and spirituality. There are many ways to talk about this topic. And I just um, want to present you here one aspect of this possible history, and that could be a new history of um, near-death experiences. And that starts in the 19th century at this intersection of mountaineering, or let's say survivors of catastrophe and natural disasters, and um, psychological uh, sciences. So to start immediately with something concrete, um, I will um, present a document from 1892. It's a report uh, from a geologist in Switzerland who was written in 1892 about his fall in, that happened in the mountains. And I will then look at the reception legacy of this text among diverse um, Psy um, specialists. And then in the end again, like articulate how we can think about these heritage of um, Psy sciences and mountaineering in the 20th century. So let me then start with this um, protagonist um, who is Albert Heim, you see him to the right. Um, he was a famous geologist and professor at ETH in Zurich. He was born in 1847 and died in Zurich also in 1937. And he published a number of books dealing with the geology of Switzerland. And he had a fascination for many mountain peaks. And one of them was the Santis. And on the Santis, the Santis look, looks like this today. It's um, 
it's a very touristic peak in the northwestern part of Switzerland. Um, high tech, you can achieve it very easily. But at that time, of course, in 1870, it was much harder to reach the summit. And so Albert Heim went with his brother and some friends uh, in a roped party. They reached the uh, summit. And when they uh, started to descend, <coughs> he tried to capture his head that was lifted by a wind blow, and he didn't reach it, and so he fell 20 meters and hit a snow field and lost consciousness. And then 20 years later, he decided that he wants to publish this, um, you know, this experience in the form of a written report, and he compared his experiences to other survivors, mostly his friends from the Alpine Club. He was a famous member of the Alpine Club in Switzerland. So I'll just want to read you his description, because it's quite... Um, detailed and it helps us also to to understand a bit the involvement of the different um, types of intersections between surviving and experience of surviving and then psychological interpretation. So that's from 1892 and it has been translated in the 1970s in the US um, and it says, so as soon as I began to fall I realized that now I was going to be hurled from the crack and I anticipated the impact that would come. With clawing fingers, I dug into the snow in an effort to break myself. My fingertips were bloody, but I felt no pain. I heard clearly the blows on my head and back as they hit each corner of the crag, and I heard a dull thud as I struck below. But I first felt pain some hours afterward. The earlier mentioned flood of thoughts began during the fall. What I felt in five to ten seconds could not be described in ten minutes that length of time. All my thoughts and ideas were coherent and very clear, and in no way susceptible as our dreams to obliteration. First of all, I took in the possibilities of my fate and said to myself, the crack point over which I will soon be thrown evidently falls off below me as a steep wall since I have not been able to see the ground at the base of it. It matters, therefore, a great deal whether or not snow is still lying at the base of the cliff wall. If this is the case, the snow will have melted from the wall and formed a border around the base. If I fall on the border of snow, I may come out of this with my life, but if there is no more snow down there, I'm certain to fall on rubble, and at this velocity, death will be quite inevitable. If, when I strike, I'm not dead or unconscious. I must instantly seize my small flask of spirits of vinegar and put some drops from it on my tongue. I do not want to let go of my Alpenstock. Perhaps it can still be of use to me. Hence I kept it tightly in my hand. I thought also of taking off my glasses and throwing them away so that splinters from them might not injure my eyes but I was so thrown and swung about that I could not muster the power to move my hands for this purpose. A set of thoughts and ideas then entered concerning those left behind. I said to myself that upon landing below I ought, indifferent to whether or not I were seriously injured, to immediately call to my companions out of affection for them to say, I'm all right. And then my brother and three friends could sufficiently recover from their shock so as to accomplish the fairly difficult descent to me. My next thought was that I would not be able to give my beginning university lecture that had been announced for five days later. I considered how the news of my death would arrive for my loved ones, and I consoled them in my thoughts. Then I saw my whole past life take place in many images, as though on a stage at some distance from me. I saw myself as the chief character in the performance. Everything was transfigured, as though by a heavenly light, and everything was beautiful without grief, without anxiety, and without pain. The memory of very tragic experiences I had had was clear but not saddening. I felt no conflict or strife. Conflict had been transmuted into love. Elevated and harmonious thoughts dominated and united the individual images. And like magnificent music, a divine calm swept through my soul. 
I became ever more surrounded by a splendid blue heaven with delicate roseate and violet cloudlets. I swept into it painlessly and softly, and I saw that now I was falling freely through the air, and that under me a snowfield lay waiting. Objective observations, thoughts, and subjective feelings were simultaneous. Then I heard a dull thud, and my fall was over. So that was his um, description in, in this 10-page article. And um, so as you may have noticed, there are several aspects he mentions, one of them um, having the sensation of being outside of his body and looking at main uh, stages of his life and that he was observing like from a distance. And other aspects that he underlines is that he had, he had the capacity to think faster than he would think in, uh, in a normal situation. But also putting like the vinegar on his tongue, which was like, a, which, which was like an invention of the 19th century and that was, um, that was uh, recommended to any alpine climbers to have in their pharmacy, you know, because if you have like a feeling of dizziness, you can just put this on your tongue. Anyways, there are va various of aspects in it, but um, what he then argued in this text was that um, out of the 20 persons that he interviewed, the, the survivors, 95% of the survivors claimed that they didn't have um, a sensation of pain, they had no fear, um, and after the fall they had um, a reduced fear towards death in general. And so then he claimed that in fact falling in the Alps and surviving might be a pleasurable experience and have a pleasurable, a good impact on your mental health. So that was basically his message. And in fact, this, this message was a bit controversial and at odds with developments at that time. And when, um, when he lectured, um, he, he presented this, um, his, this study at several occasions in, in Switzerland. And one of the critics at the time, it was a French um, literary critic, Théodore de Viseva, he reacted then to his um, to his study, and I will just read it. It's very short because it's quite uh, funny and it gives you a little bit uh, of a context of how this was perceived as a text. It's, it's just a short extract from um, this 1895 text. So the French critic says, the eminent Professor Heim, a Swiss scientist, has just given a lecture at the Alpine Club in Zurich. The Society of Medicine in Bern would have done well to invite journalists not to speak of this event. In fact, the lecture is probably more capable than the most eloquent news report of encouraging the general public to commit suicide. This is not to say that the professor had any subversive intentions. He may even have sought to serve both his nation and science by defending Switzerland against one of the criticisms often directed towards the country. Heim chose as the topic falling from the tops of mountains. Drawing on a series of arguments and testimonials, Heim endeavored to prove that a death achieved by such means, fatal falls in the Alps, would be the most convenient, most elegant, and most agreeable way of dying. So much so, in fact, that tourists no longer need feel fear when climbing to alpine summits, that even if they should lose their lives there upon the snowy peaks, they shall do so without any moral or physical suffering, savoring instead from the moment they begin to fall a sumptuous foretaste of celestial blessings. And what an encouragement, indeed, for those tourists already resolved to end their lives and to whom science guarantees an easy, poetic, and pleasurable end. So that was the reaction of Theodor Viseva, and put in a context uh, to, um, to mention just briefly that uh, in Switzerland, to alpinism developed um, uh, increasingly after the mid-19th century, and especially amateur um, mountaineering, so people who were not really good at climbing mountains. And um, uh, in fact, it, was a, it, it started to become a really a, a big issue um, for security and prevention of accidents, as some first statistics showed that uh, like b between 1880 and 1890, the number of uh, fatal falls increased six times. So it was a real uh, problem. And most of the accidents apparently happened by inexperienced tourists. So some of them were trying to pick Edelweiss and slide it and then fell to death. Others 
ate too much and others didn't eat enough or didn't have enough provisions. So there's a whole debate also of Swiss um, researchers who try to understand what their growing uh, tourism um, public is like. And here I've just put um, an image of the first uh, cog railway that was built in 1871 um, at the Rigi. And so this allowed people also to come in big masses and, and have a, you know, an experience and trying to, to, uh, to climb, but also maybe um, experience a, a fatal fall or just a fall. So anyways, but this was um, part of a big discussion also by the press that accidents are um, uh, an increasing problem in uh, mountaineering. And so this is probably... I think many of you have seen, or it's like this Gustave Doré engraving that um, uh, depicts the, um, uh, the fatal falls of the first attent, um, ascent of the Matterhorn, and where four um, alpine climbers uh, uh, fell to their death when they were descending the mountains. But so with the growing popular press, accidents were depicted as dramatic and uh, like a new phenomenon of uh, and a problem of civilization that grows always higher, that goes higher and higher and higher. And then in art, the representation also of, or the theme of falling or anticipating falling also has, starts around the same moment in around the 1820s and 30s with first some representations that rather anticipate in a romantic way the, the, te uh, the attempt of a suicide. Like here, um, there is a painting by Johann Peter Kraft, and here Fort Maddox Brown, it's 1820 and 1840, and it's based on Lord Byron's poem Manfred, this noble person who tries to attempt suicide, but then is um, prevented by a, a local chamois hunter. And in a similar way, um, more related to professional alpine climbing, there are um, this Swiss painting is from um, Martin Disterly, and it shows um, an expedition of a, of a naturalist um, from Switzerland who um, goes with his roped party and here um, slides. And here's another figure that slides and the hat, you don't see it well, is already in the crevasse and kind of um, also prevented fall. But people around involved doesn't, doesn't seem so stressed because if you look, they're still smoking uh, their pipes and... and um, there don't seem to be really concerned. So it's, it's more about, it's not really the dramas, it's more like a collective effort of, we, we, kind of, we can handle it. And, and this kind of changes then increasingly, or we, one can find with the development also of technological drawings about tec techniques of climbing, um, some more isolated drawings that really look at the body, falling body, or at this, that isolate with the fall. This is just two examples from um, Edward Wimper's book, and uh, which then in science, you have also the development in the 19th century with physiology that starts to export their laboratories towards the Alps. So a lot of historians have worked on this Alpine physiology where the studies um, try to um, or focus mostly on fatigue or the rarefaction of air and looking at what are the, how does the human being adapt to the series of problems that are caused on the Alps. And so you have this twist like from away from the sublime, um, the human looking at this nature in awe or the nature that is potentially threatful and becoming the center of experiments and in which dizziness, vertigo or fatigue are in fact very much welcome and not a problem. So in this case also Haim um, becomes very much involved in wanting to observe his experiences and expose them as, as like a learning lesson rather than just like a, as a victim that has suffered um, something bad. And maybe the most prominent example of this um, interest in the falling experience that then extends into studying the subjective experiences is Ferdinand Hodler who um, who made his um, monumental oeuvre in 1894 that was called Ascent and Fall. So I'll just comment, quickly comment this painting because it's a quite interesting example also of how um, materials um, migrate like, and how artwork can migrate uh, in different contexts. So just quickly, um, Hodler 
um, conceive this monumental painting. So it's um, in initially in three pieces, a triptych that was then seven to four, seven to fourteen meters big, and it was conceived for the Universal Exhibition in Antwerp in 1894, and uh, specifically for the Swiss Pavillon. You see the, here the Swiss Pavillon, and um, initially the series should have contained the rescue of bodies, but um, he he didn't include it because um, the curators and the organizers were already anticipating the bad reception of this work because it was so much emphasizing death and uh, like catastrophes. And in fact, the, the work didn't have a success at all. As, and uh, Hodler was forced, because that's what, that was before he was really famous, he was forced then for economic reasons to cut his painting into seven pieces. And that's why you find these are two of the seven pieces that he then sold away to different collectors in Germany and which were then reunited in the 30s in the context of um, growing um, nationalism and wanting to bring back all the lost pieces um, to the Swiss Alpine Museum. But this is just to, to give a bit of broader context to this text, so looking at uh, how in science uh, subjective experiences become a focus and actually experiences between life and death are rather uh, emphasized to kind of trigger some knowledge out of it. And so I would like to come back now to this text and to the size sciences of uh, my talk. And um, you probably cannot read it, or yes, maybe. <laughs> It's not so important, it's just to show that um, I have done this um, scheme a while ago um, where I detailed all the different um, protagonists in history who, who worked on this text that we have heard, you know, in the beginning of my talk. So it's psychoanalysts, psychologists, neurologists, physiologists who were interested in this text because they thought they could illustrate um, symptoms, you know, me mental symptoms, and that they could explain uh, human behavior. For instance, when um, how, a s how a human, na a human being reacts um, in the course of a life-threatening uh, dangerous situation. And so you, it goes from 1892 in France, where philosophers were discussing, um, is this narrative of Heim a kind of a early illustration of uh, mort imminent, but emphasizing also aspects of memory, how is this possible that you can remember so many aspects of your life? Is this comparable to other symptoms of uh, troubles or disorders of memory? And then going to some German um, uh, physiologists who were talking about Notfallreaktion, which is like an emergency reaction, and they said in, the, in, the, in a life-threatening situation, he was studying also falls from um, rooftops, so he had a, like 20 cases, and he said that in that moment, a kind of a Lebensbilderschau, like a panoramic view <coughs> of your past life is generated as a, like a psychophysiological mechanism that brings you back to the pleasurable moments of life in order to forget um, or not to feel the pain, and so that it has a psychological um, like a function. And so then going Going then into um, this history of this um, just textual source, one can really have a whole panorama that opens and that gives us access to think the near-death experiences in relation to what we call now the post-traumatic uh, stress disorders. So it's like looking at how, um, uh, how a human being reacts in the course of a life-threatening threatening, uh, dangerous situations. And there, I there are, in fact, in the literature, a lot of um, cases described mostly um, based on soldiers who uh, fought in the First World War and who recounted their experiences and their nightmares of, of you know, the, the permanent stress of exposition, you know, exposure to a potential death. Um, and that a series of really interesting descriptions that then culminated into, of course, also labeling of illnesses, but that, that give us really access to think um, 
differently about these panoramic images that we have seen uh, in um, Heim's uh, narrative. So, for example, one interpretation in the 1930s, um, it's Oscar Fischer, a psychoanalyst, who then claimed that um, if you're in a dangerous situation, and so you, you, you potentially may have the capability to remember within your old images that come up, a previous situation of fear that you had experienced, and then kind of under trigger your mind and understand that because you don't die now, and you didn't die that time, you don't die now, so you somehow kind of have this perception and conviction that there is no reason to die, and therefore this kind of has a cathartic effect and you won't fear death anymore. And this is like early propositions uh, in the 1930s that kind of anticipate what positive psychology would later claim, you know, that near traumatic experiences have a kind of a positive effect on your mental health. Like you're on your worst moment in life and you have a physical threat, but in fact you can gain force in such a moment. So it's, it's kind of showing a different way of talking about positive psychology. But to, to, come, to come now to a most crucial moment in which Haim was suddenly rediscovered and also this mountaineering literature, you know, kind of grew again to a certain popularity was in the 1960s and 70s in the context of um, an enhanced interest in death and dying. And so you find him, I just took um, uh, an example from the Spiegel um, uh, German magazine about the Schöne Sterben, where you find um, Albert Heim now very old, writing down some notes, and then the Gustav Dore. And so they mention um, Heim like as being somebody who can tell us about what it is like to die, and that it might be, in fact, a non-agonizing experience, uh, potentially pleasurable. And so this was in the context of raising criticism about the advances of biomedicine. Today, maybe it's a bit difficult to think about it because it was 50, 60 years ago, but it was a big debate, like, how can we deal with um, the many transformations in medicine, like uh, brain death, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but this was developed as a concept in medicine in 1968, that which said that if a person has a, uh, doesn't have any cerebral functions anymore, then it ca she or he can be declared dead. And this was also installed as a possibility to do organ transplantation. So um, it, it's caused a lot of fears in the population, not only about medical doctors and ethical, you know, um, people who are were concerned in, by ethics. But so in, in this, like, growing fears, so to look back into some sources, like outside of medicine was a way to talk about um, problems in society. And so you'll find also in this period, like in the United States, um, psychiatrists and psychologists who started to mimic, to mimic um, the methods of Albert Heim and who started to investigate survivors from, uh, who accidented and who fell in the mountains but um, survived. And so a series of works then developed um, looking at the perceptions, sensations, and emotions of these survivors. And there were even scales developed that were titled like Falling Experience Questionnaire, which was a very uh, specific thing from the time. And where they tried to feel, to find out more about the different sensations and if these sensations might have an impact on what they, on their be beliefs and attitudes towards death. And so one of the, um, um, one of the interpretations then of a near-death experience in a life-threatening dangerous situation, like a, a fall or a car accident or um, a horse accident or any life-threatening dangerous situation, was then to say that it happens like a, um, a dissociative syndrome, what they call it, but a split in personality, and we can find the elements that um, Haim was describing in a like quite illustrated way here in a more schematic way in which these scientists try to separate um, or, or label different elements. We're saying that, for example, memory, you, you have revival of memories, but also loss of memories after the event. You cannot remember 
every single aspect. And then you have um, sensations or heightened perception, but it's also dull and imagery is dull. So it's trying to schematize you know, the experience in a scientific manner. But what was underlying to all these studies, I've shown you only one, but it was really a big field evolving around near-death studies, was to know whether the fact that a person believes that she or he is to die had an impact on um, the beliefs and attitudes toward dying afterwards. And so they measured it in different ways. But here you see like um, persons who believe to die, yes, and persons who didn't believe to die, no. And then the impact of all these different characteristics that they studied and then trying to actually measure um, populations sensations and belief to say something more general about death. And these types of um, statistics and also describing meticulously experiences was also part of a broader um, project in, in medicine and therapy at the, at the time where um, therapists would use, for example, LSD now, not now um, therapists use again psilocybin, but at the time LSD was very prominent. They would use it to in end-of-life care units to see if um, patients um, can have like an insightful or impactful experience with the help of drugs, and if this can decrease the fears towards dying. And some would even develop specific psychotherapeutic practices in which they would um, mimic uh, traumatic experience so that people could just be um, kind of healed of their most profound fears. I mean, this is just another way of um, showing how um, life-threatening, dangerous situations here in the form of anticipation of death became uh, a subject of study. And then, of course, this is then part of this broader question, which I think has still relevance today, or comes back in certain forms, you can discuss about it. It's um, just how to deal with um, uh, terminal illness and more generally the anticipation of death. And this was a very prominent subject uh, in the 1960s. The uh, French historian Michel Vauvel called this decade the rediscovery of death because there was a proliferation of books that were dealing with denial of death, taboo of death, we need to talk about death, we need to understand death. But in fact, the underlying thing is just how can we reduce our fears and how can we just live a meaningful life? Which then culminated into what we are more familiar with, I think, and which is this also proliferation of literature written at the intersection of spirituality and medicine, like that tries to prove survival of the soul after bodily death, you know, like with life after life, or here the truth and light, but also like neuroscientific investigations into out-of-body experience as a, as a phenomenon of visual illusion, so we can explain all these visionary experiences with a scientific framework. This is not completely new, but its soul does something new in a way. And then you have also pharmacological um, attempts to explain, like, you know, with analogies, for example, the analogy of DMT, because DMT is a powerful uh, compound uh, of a plant that is used in, uh, in, um, ritual, in rituals, um, and, but that it has a similar compound uh, in that, that the, brain, the brain can uh, produce a similar co a chemical compound, and so they argued that this might in fact be the origin of our spiritual or vision, visionary experiences. And even more recently, there are, it's a growing field in science to look at how human, humans behave if they are in a, in a situation of life and death. And so they, I, I've just met somebody when I was in Cambridge in, in the US, uh, like a behaviorism, so it, it's a sociology, behaviorist study about altruism and how would you react if you're in a life-threatening situation, would you help somebody or would you escape? And so they designed this VR environment. I didn't, it didn't look completely convincing, but still they designed it and you had to go through uh, different stairs of a building and then a fire breaks out and what do you do? 
do you go to your friend, but it's just an avatar, or do you escape? And so it's a growing concern, it seems like, in certain disciplines now to rethink also th death threat and altruism. But this is just to say also that um, this is part of this very ancient problem, is like, how can you experience death without having to die somehow? And this was a, a problem since antiquity for, for many philosophers, and among them, of course, um, Michel de Montaigne, who had himself a, uh, an accident while he was uh, riding a horse, and who claimed that afterwards, in fact, he he didn't fear death anymore, and he, he was promoting that it's important to contemplate death in everyday life so that you can kind of um, anticipate it. But so um, this is to say that I just showed you now with the figure of the alpinist and Albert Heim in particular in Switzerland in a specific moment in history, how the, the falling body or, or just the near-death threat kind of had an, um, a continuous history of uh, consideration in, in, in medicine, in psychology, in therapy, trying to say uh, something more about how we deal in dangerous situations and if risk, danger, a near-death threat kind of ha can have a positive effect on our, on our um, mental health. And so I want to conclude just with um, kind of a, how do you say, pinwand in... In <laughs> it's like a oh, pin pinboard, yeah. It's like just a pinboard uh, that I made quickly, prob um, just to illustrate some thoughts, you know, like how you can think of the relations between mountaineering or let's say extreme sports and science sciences. And so I didn't talk about um, this whole development on the right that you see, like the development of sanitary, uh, of sanatoriums in alpine altitudes, you know, that developed uh, in the early 20th century and which um, culminated then in, in uh, written pieces like S Thomas Mann's um, Zauberberg, which in fact then becomes, first it's to heal, but then in fact it's also a place where people die. And so interestingly, it makes reference to this Viseva, the critic that, we, that I've read about the promotion of suicide. Somehow there's a continuous history in Switzerland that the critics ad addressed to Switzerland were like, you promote um, uh, Sterbetourismus, like tourism for dying, which somehow with exit and still has yeah, some, some relevance. So it's interesting. But there's another example of, of called the cult of the naked body and sun therapy, also in the early 20th century. And then with extreme sports, the development in the 1950s and 60s to climb without the help of oxygen and kind of how can your body adapt in the most extreme situations and how Reinhold Messner, one of the famous alpine climbers, kind of claimed that um, this uh, very confrontation with death kind of has an impact on your mental strength. And then a, s a, a series of strange and repetitive patterns of of representations of the psychic apparatus or psychological mechanisms in terms of topographies of mountains, like to illustrate the unconscious processes. Or here you have also uh, positive psychology um, uh, representations, you know, of the uh, self-realization or peak experience, like here with Maslow. And then again, transpersonal interpretations of near-traumatic experiences as something potentially beneficial for mental health. So saying that nadir experience, like the lowest point, can kind of become the peak, the highest point of your self-realization. And um, so I just want to conclude with these quick um, notes. And um, yeah, <laughs> and thanks for your attention and uh, look forward to the discussion. Actually, we could keep it this way. Yeah, if there is immediate questions and otherwise later.
does it work? If there's any uh, questions uh, about uh, for, it, for it to Elena for the talk so far, we could uh, do a couple of questions now. Everybody's contemplating that. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, if there are questions, we can you know discuss briefly, and then move to the conversation. Otherwise, we will just have the conversation. Also, save save up the questions for <laughs> afterwards. <Yeah. laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, this is this is not completely comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, so I, I thought it was really great how you how you demonstrated like how how something um, as elusive as an experience becomes material in a way mm. because it generated so much. I mean, uh, a whole almost a whole genre within uh, um, within book writing, uh, scientific speculation. Uh, it generated material in psychology. Um, so I think um, also it's very appropriate for the title bringing something back because he really did bring something back uh, from this uh, this experience. I wonder, I'm, I'm, I was in a way curious about this um, since I guess what he um, from falling what he, uh, that it was new to read this kind of account mm -hmm. but then one part of it is very familiar and that's this this part which is the kind of uh, re-experiencing one's life mm. uh, in a flash. I usually, mm. when I was small, I, I encountered it or when I was young from, from people who drowned. It was always, yeah. it, was, it was kind of such a well-known story. If you drown, you, mm -hmm. you see your life flash by. So yeah. I wonder where it comes from and yeah. how early that, that idea kind yeah. of enters. So I, 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 that's a, it's a good question. I didn't go further back than Thomas de Quincey. You know, the, in his autobiography, he mentions this um, um, this uh, incident of a, uh, I think, of his aunt, who nearly drowned and um, who who really thought she was about to die, and then had all her like main significance moments of her life flashing up in front of her and then I noticed that from the mid 1850s or let's from the 1850s I didn't go further back but probably I know that in the 18th century already in medicine uh, those physicians who tried to reanimate people who nearly drowned they started to you know, notice that, in fact, something happens in these fractions of seconds. But they wouldn't illustrate it in a theory, you know, or they wouldn't make a theory. So it's really something that kind of built it up in the mid-1850s, which I think is some is the coincidence of um, several developments, like in culture and medicine. So it's the increasing use of anesthetic uh, and analgesic substances you know in medicine and and the and the development of ideas in medicine that it's actually good to have a non agonizing death so like the the away from the christian tradition that says you have to suffer somehow and you have to do all the important things before you die but in in medicine increasingly with the pharmacological developments they started to think that in fact it's good not to suffer and to to diminish pains and so within this context medical doctors started to take the quincy's and other narratives to explain look at this in fact if you nearly drown it's a pleasurable experience and you have no pain so probably it's good to you know to have um to have a medicine that also allows to reduce um, reduce pain, and then on the other hand, um, neurology and psychiatry um, in the 19th century, they were called alienists at the time, but they were really fascinated by problems of of memory and pathologies of memory, and you find several sources, of, of, uh, mostly in French psychiatry, where they would study s different cases of of people who. Um, who survived a nearly drowning, and they try, tried to understand um, this problem in relation to other pathologies. And then, interestingly, some also um, then referred to early cinemas, you know, and the phenakistoscopes and other types of um, rapidly 
uh, showing images dispositive, so I don't know how to put it, but it's, it was really a, a strong interconnection of how to represent these events and how to see them also through the lenses of you know, what would become then cinema. And so I would suggest that the interest in po panoramic memory, which is a popular belief and which people just tell each other, when, but it has become like an issue for medicine and, and for, for different reasons. One of them is to just testify that death is actually not a painful experience and that yeah. it might be important to to put this an emphasis on that, you know, in medicine. Yeah. Another thing that, that struck me was this um this relationship to art. Um I was thinking of uh, I mean normally I would I would kind of assume that um that this um this going inward into experience is a is a kind of a twentieth century thing. Uh that um in the 19th century, exploration was uh, geographic. Mm -hmm. People would um, travel towards the North Pole and the South Pole, mm. and 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 those were the kind of um, territories to to throw light on. Mm. But uh, in the 20th century, exploration turns inward, mm. uh, with Freud, the unconscious, and uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, was that the question? Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, the religious uh, imprints that we all have. Oh. <laughs> How do we do it? Hello? Yes. I was wondering about um, the religious imprints that we all have. Um, they um, create uh, ideas uh, and I think that will um, that will uh, yeah. influence uh, yeah. the way we react in those situations. Mm. Uh, you haven't said much about religion, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I just uh, wonder mm -hmm. what you think about it. Yeah. Um, of course, this is like, um, I would say it's the main aspect probably in the, in every in any personal situation of a human being being confronted to death, there is the personal belief and religion, religious background that comes um, into question. And I haven't considered it being more interested in the scientific interpretation of the experience. But y yes, you would have to compare it to that. But in fact, even the what I can say is that even the scientific interpretations are very much embedded in a kind of religious um, interpretation of how even the idea that you have to see the, the main aspects of your life to kind of almost like in a confessional way, like you, you look at what you have done and even what you have done wrongly and that you kind of make a synthesis of your life just before you die and that you cannot die if you don't reflect upon your past. I think this is a this is a very um, prominent aspect that comes even in Heim's narrative. And so um, and then I, I mean there's so many different ways in which you can investigate and I think it's you can only talk about it if you go into specific religions and cultural backgrounds, you know, but you can start to compare and then you can say, oh, in the Tibetan, Tibetan Book of Dead, the, you know, the 40-day journey is somehow an out-of-body experience, but they wouldn't explain it that way precisely. So we can do analogies between different religious systems, but probably it's not exactly what one would perceive in, a, in its own religious system. So... I don't completely answer your <laughs> question, <laughs> but um, I, ha I have a... Maybe you have, a, you have an example or... <laughs> no, I just have a hypothesis, yeah. and that is that uh, there are some similarities or something that is common for every human being, and that is also common in the different religions. Mm -hmm. So maybe that comes to, to our minds mm -hmm. in those kind of uh. situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think though that um, if we take Tibetan <laughs> Buddhism, <laughs> um, they have this called a dark retreat where people are in complete darkness uh, for 40 days and have uh, almost no, uh, basically no interaction with, with anybody outside. So what happens is that, and it also happens for people in, mm -hmm. in prisons, uh, not only monks, but what happens is that um, what they say, the, the, the darkness uh, behind, or the darkness outside, or the darkness behind the closed eyelids turns into light. They start um, basically hallucinating. Mm -hmm. And um, and they also have another practice, which is uh, staying awake, remaining conscious and sleep. And and that is actually preparing for dying. So so that is a, a quite different mm -hmm. approach uh, to to the um, to that transition. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like a yeah mm. rehearsal so to speak. And uh, yeah. yeah, and it's true. Like the light is like a common aspect that is revealed by this recent literature on near death experience, and but that emphasizes the survival of the soul. But saying that there is like, yeah, often they emphasize the tunnel experience is black, and then you see the light as like um, it's like the threshold of the afterlife somehow, where you can also meet deceased persons or you know from your life but this um this is something that you wouldn't find in the literature of surviving you know persons who survived like a fall in an in a natural setting they wouldn't really emphasize the light it's more like the struggle with the past and being like a split between acting in the present but also completely away with your thoughts and so it's also probably specific to the physical condition in which you find yourself and the critical condition. So many aspects <laughs> take into account. Yeah. <laughs> and there have been attempts by sociologists, you know, to study the impact of your religious beliefs on the experience in Germany, for example, in the 90s. But I don't know if they can say something beyond Germany, you know, so it's always quite difficult to argue in, on a more universal level. So, um, yeah, I was thinking also, yeah. But I, w yeah. Um, I thought I, I was, um, wait, if we want to move on to maybe yeah. your exhibition yeah, we can or, talk a little bit about that, yeah. or, or um, yeah. your work. Um, I, I just came, uh, because we were exchanging literature and um, books and <laughs> <laughs> stuff in the past uh, months, and then I came across this um, conversation that you had on memory with Helen um, oh yeah, Neiman yeah, or yeah. Neiman, Neiman, Neiman. Yeah. and so you and then you said at one point that uh, you were interested in memory stored within bodily sensations rather than just images or words, and so and you think of memory um, to quote you of um, and as, an, as an association that gives access to a more sketchy or ambient memory place, so different than the one of um, images and language. So I was wondering if you could reflect on how these, this ambient memory place, how do you think about it within the curated space and, you know, how, yeah, how does this translate in the <laughs> curated space is uh, probably a a difficult question, but yeah. I was just thinking, walking through your yeah. exhibition, and also, you know, how do you try to put this fragmented um, results of a memory that is dispersed in, in bodies and, you know, coming from different historical periods, popular beliefs, technologies, and how does then this memory translate into the curated space? So just what <laughs> yeah, can you talk yeah. about this yeah, yeah. process? So I would be <laughs> curious. Yeah, so I think it, it also relates to what, what Steiner mentioned, uh, this idea of, um, of inhaling the show, which I sometimes say, ah. that this uh, kind of uh, seeing the show through the body. Um, and, and what I like about these uh, more sketchy areas is that they are, it's also kind of like, um, it's also the p possibility of some kind of transformation happening mm. that um, these kind of uh, things that are not quite, that are felt but not quite formulated, they contain a potential. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, I mean, maybe that's played out in, in Tarantism, this mm. film of frantic dancing where, where, where this uh, 
this movement or, or this body kind of um, uh, almost out of control mm -hmm. or this moving body mm -hmm. um, turns to be uh, almost a sort of therapy, uh, w mm. a way to, to work thi through things that uh, cannot be worked through otherwise. Mm. Um, because we always tend to go towards uh, recognizing things and uh, going towards uh, language and, and clear images. Mm. So it's a, it's a way to just discuss this area as, and I think it's very important because uh, exhibitions take place mm. and takes place uh, in, in spaces, right, in mm. physical spaces. So, so I think that there has to be some kind of um, um, agenda for, for how mm. this space is dealt with. Of course, it's dealt with as a social space, a, a place to meet uh, and a place mm -hmm. to go. Um, but maybe also on, on another level, it has been my way of, of dealing with the physical yeah. space. Um, and, and, the, and the physical space is, is pretty much a given now, but I think it, it, it might not be such a given. Mm. Uh, I, was, I, saw a, I saw a show on uh, new digital media at the New Whitney Museum. It's, it's a... It's a mm one and a half year ago, I think. And, uh, and it struck me uh, that Whitney built this enormous and very, very um, uh, elaborate new museum in, 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 in New York. Uh, and, um, and it struck me that this, this focus or this question about mm -hmm. the impact of digital media was in a way, and they never formulated it, well, as if the institution was asking itself, what do we do in this new world? Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, there was probably more fear than they are mm -hmm. acknowledging, a fear that they might not need this building uh, in, in tr 30 years. Mm -hmm. so, so there was also a way of kind of developing new ways of doing shows. So I think it's, it's necessary also mm -hmm. to address these things, these things that has to do with physicality mm -hmm. as part of doing uh, art shows. They're of course always there, but, but more of um, more in terms of having a, an idea about what that can mean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But did you think also of the space as the exhibition space as like a, a memory experience for the viewer himself or herself, like play with, you know, the personal aspects? I know that you you started to collect like the experiences of those who made the journeys in your <laughs> past exhibition. So is this a way also to redistribute um, fragments of your work or results? Or I think it, this exhibition is very much built on, on kind of um, seeing, uh, especially another exhibition I did where, where people fell asleep doing the meditations. It were the, the, the rooms were a little bit more light. And, um, and, and it's uh, just a, it's a particular... I mean, being a, in a public space with somebody, who, with people who sleeps, is, is kind of uh, not a given. Mm. I mean, usually you see people you know sleeping, but, but seeing strangers sleeping. And then this thing that, that everything was together in one space, that there were people sleeping, there were people chatting, there were people uh, also doing the meditation, visiting the meditation. Mm. You can quite often see the relaxation hit the mm. body. Um, so there were all these different states. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that also, for me, relates to exhibition making. Um, I saw, saw images of when this building was further. It was always an ex exhibition place, I think. And, and at, at that point, um, people would come here to study an exhibition. I think that would be the mode, and that would mean that people would carefully walk from one end to another and study each work mm -hmm. and each label, all the information about. And that has changed tremendously. Uh, now we have a completely different uh, mm -hmm. approach to experience mm -hmm. um, and what the exhibition experience sh should be. And probably the, the works that I did with, with mm -hmm. Steve and the, 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 we call them inner space travel, are probably what is, is at, at most at mm -hmm. odds with the exhibition format. Mm -hmm. Um, so, because that's that's not normally something you associate yeah. with a public yeah. space, yet you go inward instead of like yeah. kind of going outward. And then I would have another. <laughs> I don't want to colonize <laughs> the discussion, but I just have a <laughs> question. I'm really curious about, and maybe the public wants to comment on that. But um, I, I I was always struck in your work that so because you connect these 
different areas of popular beliefs and like maybe hidden events of the general history and then you take uh, scientific examinations, technological inventions and you kind of combine them and in and, and your work then there's a series of also eccentric personalities that come up like uh, I don't know, hashish smokers <laughs> in the 19th century and then Alistair Crowley and um, tarantula dancers. So you have a series of eccentric personalities making them making me think that somehow you s yourself you're a kind of an eccentric <laughs> personality <laughs> probably but so uh, my question is like how um, how do you think what is what do you think is the um, the major outcome or what we gain from this practice that we reinvestigate the past you know that we create a historical that we reduce this distance you know between today and history I mean that's what I do in my work mm -hmm. and you kind of um, embody and enact it in a very beautiful way and what what is then the what is then this bring us in art or in for our experience in general and I just wanted to bring in also this uh, concept idea of synchronicity what you think about <laughs> this you know that um, this is a concept that uh, Carl Gustav Jung <coughs> developed um, and which was based on that you may see certain forms in your dreams or like there's this famous example of the scarabee in a dream and suddenly when you talk about the dream the scarabee is somewhere hidden mm. you know behind the window and so how do you deal with synchronicity with of these eccentric <laughs> personalities that come and show up and that, you know, sh they show up in my work, they show up in your work, they show up in other works. So what is this? Is this synchronicity? Is this fashion? Is this what? <laughs> and what do we gain from this um, reducing the distance of today and the past and kind of creating these situations of very complex sensorial relationship to the past? I think I think um, these figures um, probably remind me of artists, uh, and there's, uh, there, there's somehow artists. I mean, like some mm -hmm. of them would be be charlatans, and I think that's mm -hmm. also uh, part of the artistic role. Uh, um, and and some of them try to to do things with very little means. Uh, and one example of that is this uh, this film of uh, called "Of Spirits and Empty Spaces" with the uh, where this group tried to invent a new kind of sewing machine mm -hmm. through a trance dance. And, and, and they were members of the free love movement, which mm -hmm. today would be feminism. Uh, and they were trying to circumnavigate, to get around the patterns of how Elias Howe, who had uh, de successfully developed a sewing machine. So, so this sewing machine was extremely expensive. And they had this idea that if they could develop another kind of sewing machine, um, they could sell it much cheaper, and then it would be possible for women to make a living uh, sewing for people. Um, so, so there was a very um, there's, there's several things that that interest me. And, and by the way, what you see next to it is uh, house machine, the the machine mm. they were trying to get by, so to speak. Um, there are several things that, that interest me. I mean, that very early in the United States, there was great fear of, um, of um, big corporations coming in and, and, and taking over, and taking over invention like the telegraph mm. or, or the sewing machine. Mm. Uh, so it was, they were trying to fight that with, with very little means. And also, their, so that was one thing. Another thing is that there's their way of interacting what they did together, they basically danced together, and they were they, w they were this machine, and they c tried to collect it from that. I find that also quite extraordinary that that um, that their social interaction would be so different from what you anticipating anybody doing in 1868. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those two things were, were um, a kind of. It reminds me a lot of art because I think when I was in San Francisco, um, uh, it has been the. It was in a way a little, uh, to some degree, it was shocking to to meet people from the tech industry and 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 um, 
And I think there's, there's this idea that we as artists, we, we are kind of part of, 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 of doing images or, or, or shaping the world or generating ideas, doing these things. But, but I think uh, for, for people I met from the tech industry, I could be, you know, a, like a semi-professional folk dancer or something like that. Mm. It was so mm. removed from, mm. from their reality, they mm. really felt that they were shaping the future. Mm. So, so there's a direct link, uh, and I think also in the piece, uh, maybe this act, this work, this thing, is very much about that. Is uh, it's about developing an act and and trying to use these ab opportunities, which might be compared to the tech industry, very mm -hmm. very like a very very slim ch chance of making an impact, but but trying to use what we have mm -hmm. to to make some kind of impact mm -hmm. or uh, move things in in some kind of direction. Mm -hmm. So. I wonder if there is there any yeah. questions? <laughs> so maybe I'm um, asking a question which is a bit um, starting from the end. Uh, the last um, picture that you showed mm -hmm. with the pinboard. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, showed some examples of popular psychological theory, mm. uh, which is very much about um, improving or optimizing um, the self, which is maybe in general a, a big topic of uh, this type of um, science or uh, popular interest in um, scientific research about uh, the mind and uh, how our, how our psyche works. Mm -hmm. And um, that, in a way, has a lot to do with um, economy or um, how we as uh, subjects work in contemporary economy. Mm -hmm. That, um, yeah, I mean, it has been mm -hmm. variously described that uh, we are kind of um, constantly uh, subjecting ourselves to the need of optimizing uh, mm -hmm. ourselves more and more. And I was I'm wondering, uh, l looking at that from um, looking at the material from uh, such a perspective of economy and uh, how mm -hmm. our body relates to economy and economical exploitation, mm -hmm. uh, how what you described earlier, an interest in near-death experiences, mm -hmm. um, how that might connect also to mm -hmm. maybe questions of economy. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. Thanks. This is a good. Um, it's, a, it's a very good remark. As a allows to to broaden a bit the picture also because I, I gave this side picture so of course it's very much related to economy um, there are different ways in which um, economy plays or played a role for instance if um, you look at the the development of studying um, attitudes towards dying, for example, with LSD in the 1960s was, was very much connected to a series of new analgesics that were developed uh, in medicine and which were tested then to, to look at the sensations of pain. For instance, it was more about learning about pain and learning about the effect of certain drugs in comparison with LSD than just about bringing spirituality into medicine. And so... It's just because it was used in end-of-life care, it started to develop as a psychotherapeutic technique, but in the beginning it was all about pain studies and analgesics and pharmacology and tried to deliver more and more results so that you can, in, 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 in close um, interrelation with uh, pharmaceutical laboratories. And so I think, um, in general, if you think about the human nature or this just a subject in a... In, in society, you have always to think it in relation to a broader field of, um, of, of knowledge and economy. So, for instance, medicine is never just, or psychology is never just independent study. It's always like what some historians of science call embedded science because it's so closely related to uh, pharmacology. And, uh, you know, we also, we always choose also in relation 
to the most effective products or that are on the market. We won't choose just the, the we want a most competitive doctor or you know the a supplement that we can find on the market. So it's not just because we, li we believe it's, it will heal us, but because it's competitive. So we also have completely incorporated this kind of competitiveness when we think about our um, performance. And so this um, is now with this recent um, renaissance in psychedelics is, is a good example where, um, I mean, th there's emphasis on mystical experiences, but in, but in fact it's all about also mastering concentration and performativity and being able to work, you know, and, and have fun at the same time. It's also our expectations change also in function of what has been developed in, by the in industries. So it's strongly responding. And then to the maybe um, older examples in near-death studies, I mean, it, it was closely related um, at the end of the 19th century to these physiological studies to see look, what is the effect of fatigue on the body. And this later culminated in aviation studies, for example. And also, you, have, you can always find um, antecedents you know, of, a, of a discipline that developed in the 20th century in the 19th century. So, I mean, this is just uh, some brief comments, you know. It, I don't know if it ever responds to <laughs> your this. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, I would like to make a brief comment on uh, mm -hmm. physiology of, uh, mm -hmm. of the near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been doing some research okay. I read several years ago about um, uh, lowering oxygen tension mm -hmm. uh, for research persons. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if you are having a lower dose oxygen tension mm -hmm. in your brain, mm -hmm. then you will uh, mm -hmm. recapture mm -hmm. uh, these experiences. Mm -hmm. you are, uh, having about the same experiences mm -hmm. as uh, mm -hmm. reported uh, in near death. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? Yes, I've, I've, I've come across these um, recent studies about the lack of oxygen, uh, which was also um, described by some of the pharmacologists, you know, who reflect on DMT. But then, uh, but then this might give a link also to high altitude alpinism, you know, where they perform with a lack of oxygen and if they report certain forms of experiences that this might be compared, you know. So I don't know if in your studies you came across. No, no, but, uh, but I, I was thinking uh, in the same manner as, uh, as you, uh, um, if you're high up in the Alps, uh, uh, the oxygen tension in the air is low. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, you already have a quite low oxygen tension for your brain. And if you <laughs> fall, mm -hmm. then you stop breathing. Mm -hmm. And may, maybe you ha mm -hmm. are having these experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, right on. Yeah. We should try. <laughs> <laughs> That's my proposal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you let me know <laughs> when you do it. Uh, and and um, uh, it's also well known from, uh, from uh, medicine that if you are having, uh, at old age, if you are having a pneumonia, and, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, then you know the oxygen tension mm -hmm. uh, will be very much lower than you, you are having a uh, peace, peaceful death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I didn't satisfy. Yeah. I might have a, a question for you, Akim, actually, uh, if I can, if I manage to formulate it. Um, um, because a lot of what we have been talking about here is kind of. Uh, different uh, uh, states of consciousness uh, and that uh, bodily and mental experiences uh, that that can cause and which appears a lot in your exhibition through sort of uh, historic examples whether it's uh, uh, drugs or uh, psychedelics or trans dance or but with these new um, sound works it's almost like you are not just talking about and showing and um, referring to these experiences, but sort of uh, um, trying, attempting to have visitors to the exhibition experiencing something similar, like this, this uh, hypnagogic state between consciousness and, and sleep, which unconsciousness. Mm. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit, a little bit about those 
particular works in the in the exhibition and what you are how you have been thinking about them i think um i see the the narratives so to speak um um as as what you can call as as pre pre image content and 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 what do i mean by that uh, um i think we all know this sensation of um falling like like we're stumbling we're we're going down the stairway or something like that um uh when we are almost falling asleep and then mm. but in a way the the pre image to that would be walking uh so it's almost like the that mm. leads to the stumbling so so the narratives are a little bit like that they they set a scene and then something else mm -hmm. happens um so um i think we we are trying to it's something stephen and i do a lot we're trying to put people close to the edge of sleep uh this this uh, hypnagogic mode and and sometimes um um some people fall asleep and for some people it doesn't work so well and and uh, uh and others maybe go right to the sweet spot um <laughs> another thing that's important for me is is of uh, is that the uh, that the the spaces so to spe speak are, are built by people visiting them so there's one space called department of abandoned futures and and it's sort of a archive of all the things that did not happen uh and i think that that is in a way built by people visiting it because every person who visit that space makes that space or creates it or or find something there maybe on a personal level maybe on a different level on a uh, so so um so it's a different sort of a community i uh, it's a more of a mental community mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh and and uh, and as we see that could be quite powerful with the mm. near death experiences something that's built on 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 something that might not might be real or not be real uh can be such a machine that generates like thousands of these books and studies and all kinds of things so i think we shouldn't devalue these things mm. that are are more hazy and and more kind of um, um imaginary um uh, they can be very significant so That's yeah a good way to end it's it's not so easy to come in from the street and to understand uh, your background and everything you have been thinking and studying <laughs> so excuse me for that one but uh i am thinking about uh, near death experience and what about um how near are we talking about um, fearing death but you're not at all into death are you into death you're almost dying that's something else mm -hmm. uh we are just talking about fearing fear of death mm -hmm. right now here we were mostly talking about being in a life threatening dangerous situation yes. Yes. so you have a fraction of second to realize yes. that you probably will die but you you won't die because then you will talk mm. about what you experienced but which has been compared to the anticipation of death and terminal illnesses which can happen also in the course of one or two weeks mm -hmm. and that has been compared as having similar characteristics of denial of reality mm -hmm. and then struggle trying to survive followed by depression like realizing that there's nothing to be done and once you realize there's nothing to be done you're just floating either in acceptance or or you just continue to struggle until the bitter end but if you reach the stage where you can just accept it can also involve like sensations of well-being or transformations i mean that was the analogy that was made at the time and it is still sometimes made today but of course the situation is different in a clinical setting or yes that's I, i didn't talk about these cases yeah just to make the distinction yes uh i i also thought that uh, my neighbor's uh, comment was uh, interesting yes because uh, uh those um uh, models they are the mm -hmm. foundations of uh, economy thinking and especially mm -hmm. the marketing mm -hmm. and the public relation mm -hmm. so it's, it's mm -hmm. just uh, mm -hmm. 
making imprints on uh, us all, mm -hmm. our thoughts, ideas. And I guess that um, how we react in those kind of situations will be it's a cultural mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I was 14 years old. I was traveling in a car, and my mother didn't know I was there. And it was a, a road that was very slippery, so the 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 car um, quickly, like how can I say, um, it was almost like floating over the the road towards um, a hill. And it was this white, um, um, the white uh, fence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember I saw that fence coming very close. It was dark and it was a white fence. And everything went really slowly. And I was thinking, this is a pity. I'm only 14 years old. I will die now. And there was so much I had to do. But well, I will die now. And then I fainted and everything was fine. But I always remember that so strongly because it was total acceptance with mm. certain sadness. Mm. And I mean, I wasn't in danger, but I was sure I was going to die. Mm. And everything went slowly. I didn't think about my mother. I didn't think about anybody else. Mm. It was just like, I had so much to do in my life and now mm. I can't do that. Mm. <laughs> it's kind of a beautiful memory. Yeah. I wasn't afraid at all. Just wanted to share. Thanks for <laughs> sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Haim who thought, I'm not going to be able to give my introductory lecture at the university. I want to do this and yeah, this. <laughs> I, 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 you know, a young person, I have so much to do. Yeah. yeah I wasn't afraid at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. There yeah. was a question uh, in the back. Jan. I had a question about the, um, uh, this matter of uh, language that Joachim pointed. And that struck me uh, at the beginning of your presentation because you talk a lot about uh, images or pictures that people see uh, during this experience. Mm -hmm. But these pictures are transcribed into words mm. and the importance of mm -hmm. the writing in the um, way of uh, telling the stories of this experience is extremely prominent. Mm -hmm. uh, could it be through the history of literature of drugs from the 19th century towards the psychedelic era? Or um, the way that it's today, uh, s the, the most, uh, it seems to be the most um, immediate reflex that we have when we have l gone through an experience mm. that is extreme, is to try to write it down and not to draw it or not to film it or not to tell it. Did you study this? Uh, uh, because w I don't know, one can think about René Domal or Henri Michaud, or, you know, th there's really this sort of tradition mm -hmm. uh, that tries to place words on things that you can't represent. Mm. Yeah, it's <laughs> a good question. Um, There's also predominance of words. Um, well, it, there's a distinction if it's words in poetry or literature and if it's words in science. Um, but there seems to be also the underlying belief that if it's words, it can be, it can kind of testify a situation rather than an image. We are probably still in this belief, and in the case of near-death experiences, we believe we tend to believe more what a physician writes about near-death, if he or she experienced it, than just a common person, because we think that also writing and a scientific description of a phenomena kind of brings us closer to the truth. So I think, and we tend still to believe that literature is just a subjective way of feelings that is transposed to, um, you know, in, in, in the written word. So I think there is really this limiting aspect. And some of the, um, uh, I mean, some of the 
some of people, some of the um, therapists, for example, have been interested in um, uh, life-threatening, dangerous situations or, or cr crisis or, or depression, and who, who adopted a Jungian uh, perspective, for example, they, ha they started to explore more and more the images as a, as a way of you know, explaining or, th or thinking through the experiences. And so I think that's maybe a way to enter an, a different tradition and kind of to unfold really a, a tradition of image making, which I think is still remains a bit unwritten, actually, how we think about these experiences in terms of images. I mean, beyond the religious imagery that we have, you know, disposal in paintings or... But yeah, and how do they migrate between the different milieus and if there is a correspondence with text, I think, yeah, you, this is a very important question and I'm, tr I'm trying myself to find out how to assemble it, you know, with the text, so thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Well, I, the only thing I thought about uh, all this thinking is about, uh, as I understand, sudden near-death experiences, very short seconds where you, where you have your special experiences. In life, uh, many people are thinking about after death <laughs> and what experiences would be after death. So what I just want uh, from scientific experience from near-death experience, have you never found that, in a way, people in that situation have some thoughts which are not retrospective, but more about actually what happens now? Is that, in a way, uh, blown away when you have to concentrate for these few seconds just before you die? You mean then we miss to think if about you, what happens after? Uh, if you form all your talking about it like statistics or things you have uh, uh, all these interviews and so on and, and written uh, sources about uh, uh, near-death experiences mm -hmm. and we are talking now about uh, sudden near-death experiences mm -hmm. like nearly drowning mm -hmm. or nearly uh, death in, mm -hmm. near death in falling and so on. Uh, the only thing is I don't think I, I miss it. I just find it very interesting whether or not in such sudden uh, experiences are they always in a way retrospective or are they sometimes having some, have they at all time to think about what many people think about in life or what comes after death? Is that not reflected in any yeah. of this material? No, of course it is. Not that much in, in this material about nearly drawing and falling, but if you look at the reports from uh, patients who have had a successful cardiac reanimation, you will find these considerations about afterlife and meeting deceased persons, but that is in a clinical situation where they have been proclaimed clinically dead, so it's a, li it's a bit of a different situation, but you might find there this kind of anticipation. <laughs> okay, uh, I think maybe that uh, rounds it up. Um, I want to thank uh, both of you, Joachim and Elena, and for all of you <laughs> for uh, coming. Um, and I'd also just like to mention that in exactly in a week, next Saturday, uh, we have a new platform event related to Martin Beck's, the other exhibition downstairs, where Martin Beck will be in conversation with Tim Lawrence. So come back for that. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thanks.